we'll turn me to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians 6, and we'll continue our study of the spiritual warfare. Uh, remember, this is all grounded upon our study of the Lordship of Christ, and as part of submitting to his Lordship, we need to remember that we are to engage in spiritual warfare. Uh, we must remember that he desires to expand his kingdom in a world that is opposed to his reign, and when we desire to see his kingdom uh, expanded through the gospel proclamation, we need to understand that there's going to be opposition. And so we shouldn't be shocked, we shouldn't be surprised that when we experience this opposition, as though there's something wrong on our part. Uh, we are doing what our Lord has called us to do. We are to engage in this war because we are to follow in the footsteps of Christ. And if you just go back and read through the Gospels, you're going to see that he was engaging in conflict constantly. And so the other thing we need to understand when we look at his example, we need to do more than just engage. We need to fight in accordance with Christ's battle plan. And so it, it, we, we need to sit down and study his battle plan out. We need to understand his instructions if we're going to uh, be successful on the battlefield. So here we have in Ephesians 6, uh, instructions given to us by the Apostle Paul. So let's read it, and then we'll continue our study. Finally then, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And so here within our text, uh, the text tells us very clearly we're at war. And I think one of the worst things we can do as soldiers of Christ is to ignore that that war exists and to live with this peacetime mentality when the war is still raging on around us. You would think this the sheer number of children that are denying the faith in this land, the sheer number of children who abandon the faith and go in a secular route would have wakened the church up at least 40 years ago. But now we have two generations of children going and being educated, being brainwashed into thinking secular thoughts. They deny the faith and whatever these churches are doing, something's not right. We're not in accordance with God's game plan here. And so something is not being is not being conducted properly because we're not seeing the blessings of God with respect to our children across this land. And so this text tells us we're at war. My suspicion is we got comfortable in this country. We took the blessings of God and misinterpreted those blessings as to think the warfare was over. But it never was. It never stopped. Our enemy never put down his weapons. And we need to remember that our enemy is very subtle. Our enemy never walks through the door waving a flag saying, I'm here today to destroy you. It's just not how he works. He's very crafty. He's very subtle. And we'll see. We'll look at this a little bit more in just a moment. So the text tells us we're at war. And so we must stand and fight. And our, our king has never told us to give up any ground. Has the church been obedient to our king? No. We've given up ground to pagans all over the place and without much of a fight on their part. Well, I think as we go through this study, we're going to continue to see why, what happened. He says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we've been looking at the nature of this fight. And within our text, you know, we looked last time at the government system and the government structure. We looked a little bit at the magnitude of their power. You know, we saw Satan's government last week. We noted that Satan has a false claim upon this earth. And the one thing that we do know about his kingdom is that they are well organized to execute their plan of rebellion against God upon this earth and to come against the children of God. And so when they put their concentrated effort to destroy a person, to tempt a person, to bring him down, it can be overwhelming. 
We need to at least admit and acknowledge this. But Paul didn't write this to teach us that so that we would despair and throw our hands up. This section is here so we don't become overwhelmed, so that we don't become discouraged, so we don't uh, fall to despair. This section is given to us to encourage us to stay on the battlefield and just don't yield an inch of ground. When you read about the first century martyrs, that's exactly what they were doing. Can you imagine the amount of pressure that was being placed upon these people, the first century Christians, to just, you know what, you can call Jesus Lord, but why don't you go ahead and give Caesar a little lip service as well? Now think about the pressure because the pressure wasn't just coming upon them. Can you imagine a man standing there while they're tormenting his wife or his children? And what did they do? They didn't give an inch. We've come a long way. Not in a good sense, but we've come, we, we've fallen a long way from that first century. Well, they're well organized. They execute their plan of rebellion. And what do we as churches do? Do we organize to stand and not give up an inch? No. We argue about petty stuff. We get our feelings hurt. We get easily offended. You know, we can sit here and make fun of, you know, this current generation that, that is easy. You know, you always hear people calling them snowflakes and that kind of stuff. If there's a, if there, the, the epitome of snowflake is Christian, the churches today. They get so easily offended. They get their nose out of out of order. I tell, tell you what, you, you offend me, you hurt my feelings. I will come and worship. That's where we are today. Can you imagine the veterans of World War II? Every day they woke up. I'm sure it was very inconvenient for them. I'm sure the days were tough and hard. Can you imagine droves of soldiers just standing there saying, if I don't have better conditions, I'm not fighting. If you don't stop hurting my feelings, I'm not going to fight today. I mean, what would have happened? The outcome would have been totally different. This is where we are today. And I don't make light of this. I'm not trying to poke fun. I'm trying to get you to understand this is where we are. And we have to resist this temptation to follow in the footsteps of the majority of the church that is out there who get their feelings hurt. Soldiers don't have the luxury of getting their feelings hurt. Soldiers are called to fight, gain ground for their, their whoever they're following. We follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're to execute his plan. Now, Another thing, I think, when we come under the attacks of Satan, it is easy to uh, get discouraged. I understand that. But when we start submitting to the rightful king, then understand this. The self-appointed king, Satan. Satan has appointed himself to be the ruler of this age, right? The self-appointed king, he's not going to let you go easily. So you ought to expect a lot of opposition. That should not surprise you. I can remember when I first came to the Lord, um, one of the greatest temptations that, that I experienced as a new Christian was from my friends. My old buddies, my old drinking buddies, my old partying buddies, they didn't understand. They could not grasp the change and understand it. And so what's the temptation? Well, just have two sets of friends. You know, on Sunday, I can have my church friends and I can dress up and put on a facade that all is OK. And then through the rest of the week, I can just go hang out with my buddies and do whatever. Right. That's the temptation. Christ says you can't live that way. And we need to understand that Satan will come and try to come after us and get to us through others. And so as you resolve to stand firm upon the rock word of Christ, Satan and his hosts will come after you. They're going to attack you to get you to yield. They're going to get you to compromise and sin against your king. He's going to tempt you with the riches of the world, right? Satan did that with Christ, didn't, didn't that what Satan offered Christ? He's going to tempt you through family and friends. There's no limit to what he will do to come after you and to come after your children, fathers, mothers. So we need to resolve to give full allegiance to Christ and Christ alone. So we looked at his government. Next, we looked at what the Bible had to say about the power of Satan. Go back over to Job because I know we read this last week. I just want you to see again. I just want you to understand uh, you know, we kind of think he's limited to just tempting you here and there. He'll come after you through lust and the, the, the pride of life. And he will. He, he's going to do this. But I just want you to see uh, he's got some stroke here. And so we don't need to underestimate him at all. Remember what happened um, 
when he came after Job. But, but last week we looked at the power of Satan. We looked at the power of Satan in, with respect to the names. He's referred to as the strong man, the dragon, the lion, the god of this world, the god of this age. We looked at the power uh, just due to the sheer number of his host. Uh, there's enough of him and his demons to impact the earth, right? So it's, it's, a, it's an innumerable number. So we started looking at the specific acts that are recorded here. Just pick up the reading verse 13. Let's just remind ourselves of what, what he can bring against people. Now, there was a day when his sons, Job 1, 13, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking and wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. And indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you while he was still speaking. Another came and said, then fire from God fell from heaven and burned the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you while he was still speaking. Another came to and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels. <laughs> And took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to, to tell you. But notice here the influence of foreign nations to come that Satan can, can drive upon the people of God to terrorize them. They, they apparently can control the winds in such a way that it destroys, brings destruction. And notice here in chapter 2, they can even influence and impact the health of the righteous. Notice, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves, Job 2.1, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord, said, going, for, going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incite me against him to destroy him without a cause. You get the impression that Job was not a guy who got his feelings hurt pretty easy, right? He, he's the anti-modern Christian, right? <laughs> he looks nothing like the modern Christian. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all the man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and flesh, and you will surely curse, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a posture which to scrape himself while he, he sat in the midst of the ashes. And his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as a, a foolish woman speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. My point of bringing you here is this. The deeds that are being described here by Satan just points to the powerful nature of our enemy that we, we underestimate so, so often. Uh, they have power of the wind, you know, the wild beast. You remember uh, the you know, those demons that were cast out and thrown into a herd of swine that drove them to a lake. But keep in mind, as impressive as you know these things are, that he can control foreign nations, that he can control uh, the wind and the elements, he can control, you know, he can um, um, impact your health. Uh, it just really doesn't compare to the power over the souls of men. He knows how to attack the souls of men. He knows how to bring in oppression by bombarding with temptations and temptations that lead to sin. And, and, and this is the question we have to, to, to ask as, as we resolve, as we purpose to follow Christ, and we put no limits on what Christ requires of us. Have you ever just felt like the closer you walk with God, the more disturbance, more oppression, the, the more of, of, of um, temptations that Satan brings against you? You know, as you purpose to walk closer with the Lord, sin begins to manifest itself in ways that you just can't explain with those around you. Just, just understand that this is an attack. And this is the time you have to draw near to God. Satan is trying to intimidate you. He's trying to bring in discouragement. He's trying to get you to doubt the veracity of God's word and his promises, right? He wants you to doubt the, the promises of God where Christ says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even when it seems like he's not there, Christ is saying, I'm there. That's what he's telling you. But you don't become discouraged. Satan will try to get you to, to doubt everything God has told you. But you don't doubt the truths of God's word. You begin to cling to it. You begin to apply them, just as Christ did, right? And so as, as a Christian, 
You are the object of Satan's wrath. He's going to wrestle with you at every opportunity <laughs> and understand he's, you know, what kind of enemy he is. I mean, go back and look at your notes in Revelation. Just pay attention to how Satan attacked the different churches that were submitting in very pagan lands, right? As those churches that are written about in Revelation 2 and 3. Notice how Satan comes after those churches to attack them. Many times he would use the silver ram to come after them. Well, as mighty as their powers are to the flesh of men, I think, once again, we've got to remember and never underestimate his greatest strength is against our souls. And he may come through our flesh to get to our souls. One of the Puritans said it this way. His great spite is at the souls of men. He uses physical disturbance only to upset the equilibrium of the soul. He knows how quickly its rest and peace are disturbed by groans and complaints of the body under whose roof it dwells. Truly, if Satan had no other way to work, his will on us, except by taking advantage of our frail constitutions, he would still have a great advantage. I grieve to see the soul of fallen of the of the soul fallen so far beneath its divine origin. The body, which was intended to be its servant, is has instead become its master and rules a merciless hand. So Satan exposes this advantage that he has over us as he comes through our flesh, the weakness, the weakness of the flesh. That this writer goes on to say, Satan is not limited to harassing our bodies to get to the soul. He has a nearer way of access. When man first fell, he splintered his soul's barricade against sin and left the way wide open for the spirit of Satan to enter, bag and baggage, and make himself at home. He would not leave the soul on earth uninhabited if God did not call a halt to the procession. Christ's saving and keeping power is the only thing that protects anyone from this intruder. And that's one of, just only one of the great blessings that we have and benefits that we have in Christ. But we need to remember, Satan is crafty, right? He's very subtle. He works in the wicked in much the same way God works within the saints. God works effectually in the saints while Satan, uh, the, you know, while Satan works effectually in the, the sons of disobedience, the children of wrath. The Spirit of God brings knowledge and righteousness to the hearts of the saints. Satan, on the other hand, brings an envy and, and all unrighteousness to the wicked. The Holy Spirit fills the Christian with comfort. But notice, Satan's, he just brings terror. I mean, I want you to think about um, Judas for a second. Judas, you remember uh, Satan entered into him to betray the Lord Jesus. Now, after the reward of the 30 pieces of silver, right, do you think Joseph, uh, Judas went home and thought that was worth it? Apparently not, because his horrible taskmaster drove him to kill himself, to hang himself. Satan fills his subjects with terror. He is a horrible taskmaster. And so this is why I think it is so dangerous for those who profess to be Christians, who choose to journey the road to heaven alone and unprotected with no accountability, nobody to help, you know, cheer them along the way. Think about a traveler a tra who's going to travel along a path that's known to, to have thieves, but he, he, he does so unprotected. You'd say, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not very wise, is it? Well, many folk Christians travel this way. They're going to tell you they're traveling to heaven, but then they show no desire to travel in the company of the saints. They prefer rather to have the company of worldly-minded individuals. They're not going to make the journey, are they? Worldly-minded people are not going to help you to your heavenly home. And the true saint who desires to be in the presence of the king, he understands there's just going to be many who are going to tempt you away from him. And so you have to be able to learn to discern those who are truly there to point you to Christ, to help you along the way. There are many who are those uh, who use the cloak of Christianity just to disguise worldly activity. Just because some form of uh, participation in, in entertainment or just because of uh, some uh, group that you may decide to join just because they use the name Jesus Jehovah's Witness they got groups don't they <coughs> Mormons have groups don't they just because someone uses the cloak of Jesus doesn't mean that they're submitting to the king of kings and that that activity is going to drive you and, and encourage you home you have to be able to discern those who are just using the name of Jesus as a cloak to hide worldly activities. Here's the thing. You, you've got to understand this. You can never defend yourself alone against Satan. But here's the other truth. You can never defend with Satan against God. You need to align yourself with Christ. 
And you need to plea with him that he would deliver you from self and from Satan. Now, as we talk about Satan's power, we need to understand that it's limited in two ways. Number one, Satan doesn't have enough power to do all he wants to do. Number two, nor does he have God's permission to use all the power he possesses. God has limited him. We see this with Job, right? We see how he limits Satan. Satan desires, for example, let me try to give you some things to think about. Satan desires to dethrone God. I mean, isn't this why he went after Christ? He doesn't have the power. He can't have his desire. He doesn't have enough power to do so. Uh, God also does limit Satan. God allows Satan to expend as much of his power against us as saints in order to purge us. But, uh, you know, and there's maybe times where you feel like, you know, you're, you're, you know, God has left you to fight alone. But this that's where your faith has to really come in. This is where your commitment and trust to God's word really kicks in. You need to remember that God, he never forsake, forsakes you. For the Christian, God is watching every move of Satan in order that he may not gain victory over his child. One reminds us of, of this truth. Another Puritan said this way, he can, when God allows it, rob the Christian of much peace and joy, but he is always under God's command. When God says stay, he must stand by like a dog at the table while the saint feasts upon God's comfort. And he does not dare even snatch a tidbit for the master's eye is always on him. We, never need, we, we don't ever need to forget that. We need to remember that we will lose much comfort when we forget that God's hand is always over Satan. Here's the thing. You may not think about it in those terms, but you probably have been guilty of this. When we focus on our situation and whatever it is that Satan is bringing against us to distress us, then we lose our comfort because we forget that God has his eye upon that situation. He has his eye upon Satan. And when we focus on the circumstance or the situation or the affliction or whatever it is that's coming against us, when our focus is on that and that alone, we lose comfort because we forget God is overseeing every bit of this. Now, before we leave this area of Satan's power, let me remind us that we do not ever want to underestimate Satan's power, but... We should never flatter him by fearing him more than we trust God. So if you belong to Christ, then nothing can come into our life without the permission of God. Uh, the one who has given us eternal life, the one who has made us um, priests and kings, uh, one who has made us his children will not leave us to perish under Satan. But we want to make sure we're not here tempting God by opening ourselves up unnecessarily um, to his temptations. And I'm going to challenge you as we go through this study, the rest of the study this morning. What areas have you let your guard down? In other words, um, we know Satan is active. How's he coming after this church? Right? We know Satan is active. How's he coming after your home? I wouldn't sleep through this one. I would challenge you to open your eyes, pay attention. And make sure that you are not letting your guard down. Where is Satan coming after your home? Now let's talk about his kingdom. The kingdom of Satan. This world of darkness. He would try to convince us that he is Lord over all. But he's not. He's only Lord over darkness. The darkness of this world. Right? So this means his subjects are the children of wrath. They're not the children of light. They're not The children of light are not his subjects. He is not our God. We do not submit to him as our God. When we need to remember that Satan's empire is bounded by time. Remember, just keep this in mind. Our world is just a little spot on the time, uh, you know, a little spot of time here that's bounded by eternity on both sides, right? There's just a small blip. Satan is a created being. This means he plays a very small role because when Christ calls for the final curtain to be drawn at the end of this age, Satan is going to be exposed before everyone. His self-assumed crown that he placed upon his own head is going to be removed, and he will be cast into hell. Because this has been decreed by God, it will happen. Both he and those who submit to him will experience the wrath of God for all eternity. Remember what Paul says. Turn back over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Remember this great truth. Paul's... Helping us understand 
about the resurrection of the body. Christ is the first fruits. It's the guarantee of the future harvest, he says in verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Now, notice Christ has a commission. And his work is not going to end until he puts down all rule, all power, and all authority. Christ will overcome Satan. And, that, and we've got to grasp this. If Satan's days are numbered, then this is bad news for the wicked who choose to follow him. <coughs> this is bad news for anyone who refuses to yield to God and embrace God's king that he has set upon the throne. And here's the thing. And, and you've got to, I mean, you look around and it just seems like the sinners are just yucking it up, right? Well, they may laugh. They may laugh it up. They may put on a pretense that they're having a good time, but they're on borrowed time because their God is on borrowed time. And they do not understand. They're just pawns of Satan. Satan's leading them by their nose. They follow him because uh, he baits them with the honors. He baits them with wealth. He baits them with pleasure. An evil heart is, is, is eager to collect any kind of bonus which the devil promises, right? They ignore all the warnings from God that the wages of sin is death. They ignore all that. But keep in mind, those who walk into Satan's trap desire the fruits of unrighteousness. That's what they want. They never realize that nothing from Satan is free of his curse. There's always a cost. This is an interesting uh, uh, comment. Would it not be wise before you barter with the devil to ask if his promises come with a warranty? Can he secure the bargain and keep you from a lawsuit with God? Can he guarantee that when you die, you will not be left destitute in another world? Let the buyer be warned. Time will show how Satan has cheated you. And the sinner may say, oh, but I have already begun to collect on the pleasures he's offered. I'm enjoying them right now, the sinner says. And I would have to wait until heaven for most of the things that Christ promises. And the sinner is correct. He's enjoying his pleasures right now. But it's not going to last forever, is it? See, here's the thing with the sinner. His present happiness is going on now, but it will come to an end. And that of the saints, even though all the blessings, I mean, we experience joy and blessings here, but the blessings that we look forward to, their future to us, they will come. But here's the great thing. They never end. Right? Will we be as foolish as Esau just for just a swallow of stew, just give up our, 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 our internal inheritance that God has given to us so that we might enjoy a, a momentary pleasure? Think about the fornicator. He enjoys the momentary pleasure, oh, but it wreaks havoc. Right? Think about those who struggle with all kinds of addictions, whatever they may be. That addiction gives you maybe just a moment of pleasure. But it's not eternal. What Christ offers is eternal. I mean, think about the madness of the sinner to refuse a little hardship and affliction for this present age. Uh, they foolishly choose to endure the eternal wrath of God in the hereafter in exchange for just a, a little bit of time of feasting with Satan. Right? Go watch any of these stories of... Um, uh, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying you should, but if you if you do go go if you you know think about what happens when you know let's say for the musicians and the actors and stuff they get all they want right you, you sit there and you see these shows and these documentaries on on these bands of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and whatever you kids are listening to today but go and watch their stories when they achieve all they want every story is the same it ends up in destruction. Satan offers you a momentary just glimpse and bite of happiness for a moment. But then what is it evil? It's, it's really sad when you think about it. If Satan can keep you entertained for just a moment, what is that in comparison to eternity? Christ doesn't offer you just a momentary glimpse and taste of happiness and bliss. He offers eternal bliss. And as believers, we need to keep this in mind. No matter what we go through in this life, it's only temporary. We need to remember what God has laid up for us, what he has in store for us. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2. Notice what Paul says here. 
in first Corinthians 2 verse 9 but as it is written I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him you ever read through the life of Paul it's like man I wonder what in the world kept that dude going what kept that kept that man to endure what this is what kept him going this is what motivated him to, to endure so much in his life I mean think about what was Paul's expectation his expectation was heaven in other words his desire was to be with the Lord he talks about the fact that he was already a citizen of heaven. Why is it important? Well, it's important because the trinkets of this world had no attraction to him. His desire to be in the presence of uh, in heaven also gave him the energy to endure. Think about what he was doing while he was incarcerated there in prison. He penned these letters that we have. You know, they, they've been preserved for us. When he got back, you know, for example, when he would go into towns and preach the gospel and the Jews would kick him out or they would take him out to the city to beat him and stone him. What did, he, what did he do when he got back, to, you know, when he got his conscience back? He'd go right back into the city and do it again. Why? Because these momentary inconveniences don't compare to what was awaiting him. Now, here's the problem with you, you guys are in here that are just looking at, oh, if I could just have that car. You become a slave of the idol you want. Oh, if I could just have that television. You could just become a slave. Well, whatever it is, your entertainments, whatever it is you you give your attention and your love and your devotion to. Just remember, those little those little things might bring you momentary happiness, right? Any of you ever bought a new car and just for a moment, ah, it feels good. I like this. I feel good in it. Where are you three weeks later? That, that, that car literally really looks nice. I mean, think about it. Think about just the momentary foolishness of just pursuing after those things. And you will forsake all to get it. Now, I don't know why some of y'all are smiling. I'm just using the car as an example. Maybe I'm hitting a little too close to home. But the point here is this. Whatever it is, you don't have an eternal mind that looks at it like Paul says. Have you ever thought about your eye has not seen? You haven't even in your mind considered or contemplated. Your, your mind, even in its most creative days, could not produce what God has in store for you in eternity. How many Christians do you see living for eternity who are willing to forsake all? Just like you would go after that car. Any of you would go after that thing and put yourself in great debt and bondage to get whatever that trinket is. Do you have the same passion and zeal for what Christ has in store for you? Satan would try to rob your joy, rob your eternal vision by making you not even think about this. This is why he hangs those things out in front of you. But the Christian doesn't doesn't desire these things. He desires Christ. Can't you see? Can't you see that Satan has deceived so, so many? Eternity is a long time to live with the consequences of his deception, isn't it? Let me tell you that one again. Eternity is a long time to live with the consequences of Satan's deceptions. Now, besides being bound by time, Satan's kingdom is confined just to this world. That's important for us to understand because Satan doesn't have any influence. He doesn't have any power where your eternal, where your eternal happiness lies and awaits. Everything we love is there. One reminds us of this. What do you have of value that is not in heaven? Christ is there if you love him. Your heart is there also with him. Your friends and loved ones who have died in Christ are there, eagerly awaiting you to join them. All your work for the Lord is laid up as treasures inside the walls of that holy city. Everything you love as a Christian and desire are there. He has no influence over that. Never forget this truth so that you don't lose perspective. Satan can only perform his mischief here. Also, Satan's empire is restricted with respect to his subjects. Satan governs those that uh, are referred to as the darkness of this world or those who sit in darkness. Darkness in the scriptures, just so you understand, many times refers to false ideology. In, in, in other words, anything that's opposed to the truth. And remember, the truth, uh, particularly in John's writings, the truth is represented by light. But darkness refers to the nature of all sin. For our purposes in our discussion this morning, we're going to use darkness in the following sense. Darkness of sin in general and the darkness of ignorance in particular. Now, we're not going to be able to deal with the darkness of ignorance this, this sermon this morning, but we'll deal with this next week. But I want us to make sure we understand that Satan's rule is over those who are in a state of sin and those who are in a state of ignorance. Satan's rule is not over those who sometimes sin, you know, sin and who are sometimes ignorant. 
You understand the difference? I'm talking about those who willfully, purposely stay in a state of sin, those who willfully and purposely stay in a state of ignorance. Think about the church who is filled up with individuals. And you've met them, right? You may have relatives. I've been a Christian for 30 years. They don't know anything. They have purposely stayed in a state of ignorance of God's word. That's sad, isn't it? But we'll deal with ignorance next week. Let's talk about the other one. Why is sin described as darkness? Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but let me just cover a few. Number one, spiritual darkness causes sin. Uh, the, remember, the external cause of sin is Satan. The internal cause of sin is this natural darkness of man's soul. <coughs> this is the result of Adam's fall. Now, when the soul is illuminated by the spirit, the nature of sin is exposed and man will flee to God. Now, when the soul is kept in darkness or it hides from the truth, sin is going to continue to grow within that individual, within that person. So, you know, spiritual darkness causes sin. Number two, sin causes spiritual blindness. While there's darkness of our soul, while the darkness of our soul first leads us into sin, it is sin that leads us into greater depths of darkness. Right? It's just a perpetual circle that they that the, the sinner stays in. Sin pollutes the conscience. Sin results in more obstinance to the light that God provides. God brings light into the world, and when a sinner refuses to yield to that light, God has decreed that you will die without knowledge. In other words, the sinner will die in darkness. And here's the thing. The sinner flirts with the eternal damnation every time he rejects the light that God has offered. The sinner flirts with eternal damnation every time they reject the light that God has offered. Are you sitting here rejecting the light that God's given you? That's dangerous, isn't it? Right? All right, number three, sin refuses the light. One of the reasons why you know sin is referred to darkness is because sin refuses the light. One writes it this way, to a sinner, the light of truth is more blistering than a desert sun at midday. You remember the words of, of Jesus? Turn over to John 3. John 3. Now this, this might expose us, right? If we don't like the light of God's word, if we don't hear the light of God's word, that's, that's telling us something, doesn't it? John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The sinner refuses to walk where there's light. You understand that? And so for those, I mean, think about what we just read in Luke 22. When did the sinners there, those Pharisees, do their work? It talks about the power of darkness there. They come at nighttime. When they do their devious deeds at night. Just as an aside, I mean, we ought to be as a free people. We say we're a free people. We ought to be very suspicious of a, of a government does, that does things at night. Right? When nobody's watching. Well, anyway, this is what happens. Sinful people, you know, they stay away from the light. They, why? Because they love darkness. So for those who hate the light of God's word, Satan is always ready to help you find an escape from it, right? Many times this comes in the form of a would-be friend. If you have someone trying to pull you away from the light of God's word, you don't have a friend. You've got an enemy, right? If someone is in your life pulling you from the light of God's word, telling you to reject and disobey the light of God's word. You don't have a friend. You've got an enemy. Young children, beware of those who would come to you as a friend or a family member. But their counsel, their counsel and their advice is in opposition with the word of God. Or you have a friend or a family member, right? A would-be friend, a you know, family member that tries to counsel you, to poison you, to dishonor your parents' children. Or to forsake your, your, your duty to Christ. That's no friend of yours. Another thing you need to remember is that if you are in sin, then the worst thing you can do is hide from the light of God's word. God's word is like his, his, his word is like a light. It exposes things, and you need that, that, that your sin to be exposed. I mean, think about it. Isn't this what we do? Parent, do your children come in here? They hear a sermon, or they sit in your family worship. They ignore. They don't pay attention. They're just disengaged, right? Understand the distraction is not from God. Understand Satan is, is busy. He's working. And, you know, the enemy is working with them, so what you need to start doing is training them to hear God's word. Now, let me ask you this. Where should you be training your children to hear God's word? Some of you think this is the place for it. 
but this ain't the place to be training your children. Your home is where you should be training your children to hear God's word, right? You got a child fidgeting on the couch or, or, or what about this? What if you have a child that's sitting there scrolling through his phone while the word is being read? Or you have some wife that can't sit still and stop cleaning the dishes while the word's being read. You need to be training yourself at home to hear God's word because when you come here, this is where the saints worship God. Now that doesn't mean if your child is, you know, needs to be disciplined, take them out this one, right? But your real training ground is in your home. I want you to think about that. Think about how many times we've seen just in public. Think about how bad it must be in your home if your child is comfortable reading their emails through a sermon, through a teaching. Think about how much bad it must be in your home if your child is just scrolling through social media while the word's being proclaimed. Think about how bad it is if your child is sitting there texting someone else while the word is being read and taught. What, what are you doing at home with them? If they feel comfortable in public doing that, they don't want to be in the light. That's a problem. You need to train them to be comfortable under the light of God's word. Or think about this. Think about the droves of people who are in other churches who can endure a watered-down, compromised sermon. Who do you think is whispering in their ear to do that? Satan externally leads people to these useless worship services, and sin internally causes them to desire to want those useless sermons, those watered-down, compromised sermons. So sin refuses the light of God's word. Number four, darkness or sin causes distress. Think back to the plague of the Egyptians. One of the plagues that, that God placed upon the Egyptians is that they were struck with darkness. Now, while they sat there, go back and think back through the story. And as God plagued them with darkness, what were they doing? What could they do? All they could do is sit in darkness and despair, right? That's all they could do. All they could do is hope that it would pass. Why? Because they could not control the outcome, could they? Those who are trapped under sin are under the same plague. And that person can do nothing profitable until God lifts the darkness. And so if a sinner can do service um, while, um, you know, if he can't serve God in any kind of capacity, right, while he's under that darkness, then he cannot help himself. <coughs> do you see the danger of not bringing the light of the gospel to your family members who are sitting in darkness? They can't do anything but despair. They cannot help themselves, and you withhold the light. They need someone to come in and lift the darkness. Now, what does that say about you when you, I mean, isn't it just, hey, we're good with you sitting in your darkness. We're good with you not being able to help yourself. I mean, isn't that what we communicate to them? They need the light of the gospel. Darkness causes, sin causes distress. One gives the following analogy. Talking about the sinner, he says, He is like one who stands helplessly in a dark cellar, supposing himself trapped and doomed to die. But if a candle were lit, he would find that, that, that there's a key to the door in an easy reach. Christ is the candle that lights the way out of man's darkness. He stands with open arms, offering deliverance. Only the prayer of repentance stands between the sinner and his salvation, yet the darkness of his soul keeps him bound in Satan's prison. So here's a question for us to consider. Now wake up and pay attention. Consider this question. Do you trust God's word or do you trust your unbelieving friend or family member? Now the reason why I ask this question is because God's word tells us to bring the light of his word and the gospel to our unbelieving friends and to our loved ones. But our unbelieving friends and our family members, they tell us, well, we don't want to hear it. And after all, you shouldn't be so preachy. You know, after all, you shouldn't be so judgmental. And what do we do? We let them shut us up because we don't want them to be uncomfortable. Right? Listen, if the word of God makes them uncomfortable, then what they are telling you is I'm comfortable in my darkness. I'm comfortable in my sin. So what is the remedy for darkness? It's the light of God's truth. 
So I'm going to leave you to wrestle with that one. But make no mistake, when we allow the unbeliever to dictate the terms of what we can say and not say, then they become our God that we submit to because Christ has told us exactly how to confront those who sit in darkness. Now, unless you've forgotten, go back over to Matthew 4 because didn't Jesus have to deal with the same issue? Was first century Israel just a, a beacon of light and hope for the nations? It's not what the Bible says. Notice this. If he comes out <clears throat> as if he comes out of temptation from Satan, he comes in in Matthew 4, in verse 15, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the, of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. Right? All those who sat in darkness, he went and preached to them. And guess what? They were very, very agitated with him. Right? Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, is a Jesus that could not be ignored in the first century. He continued to bring the light. They were agitated, though, but he continued to bring the light. He brought the, God, the light of God's word to those who sat in darkness. It's clear from the Gospels. Jesus continued to go after his critics. He did not avoid the conflict. Why? Because Jesus had come for his lost sheep. The religious leaders of that day kept his sheep in darkness, so Jesus brings them the light. And those false shepherds that Jeremiah talks about, those false shepherds who kept those sheep in the dark, yeah, he agitated them. He exposed them. Light agitates the sinner. And from Christ's example, it appears to me that if I read his example from the beginning of the Gospels to the end, if I follow in the footsteps of Christ and follow his example, then guess what? The sinners need to be agitated. Right? Okay. Next, sin leads to utter darkness. In other words, sin leads to absurdity. Sin leads to destruction. On this earth, the sinner deceives himself into thinking there might be a chance to escape God's wrath. Isn't that what they tell themselves? But in eternity, there is only darkness to the uttermost. This is what Jude refers to as the blackness of darkness forever. Have you guys ever gone somewhere like uh, Ruby Falls or whatever, one of those places where they take you in a shaft to go way down, and you, you know they've got lights, and you see the neat minerals and things like that? Have you ever been there in there when they cut the lights off just to get you some idea of how dark it is? That's what I think of, the blackness of darkness forever. And it's, it's an eerie feeling. Cause even though you know they're going to turn the lights on, you, it's still an eerie feeling. In eternity or eternal damnation, the lights are not just, just not coming off. The blackness of darkness forever is what they have to look forward to. And we sit here and we sit and think, you know, it is absurd to make such a, a, a foolish choice. But that, isn't that the point of sin? Sin is absurdity. Sin is insanity. Sin brings destruction. But the sinner loves his insanity. What is saying? God's word. What is saying? Adam and Eve before the fall. That's sane. That's normal. We need to be bringing that to the insane people that we, we know and live with, you know, we have exposure to. Okay. So that's why sin is described as darkness. That's what Satan rules over. Now let me address the next question. Why are those who sit in darkness, why are they under his rule? Well, Satan is called the ruler of the darkness of this world. All those in a state of darkness are under his rule by God's decree. Those in darkness have no power to resist Satan. He rules the whole man. I mean, this is why, for example, why how an unbeliever can read God's word and just twist it. Uh, here, here's the thing. The sinner doesn't have to go to full-blown perversion to satisfy Satan, does he? Right? Satan's content with compromise. He's all right with you compromising. And many take Satan and his lead as though he were a friend instead of a cruel taskmaster. But here's the good news. Christ is the good shepherd, right? Christ, the good shepherd, stands by. And if the sinner would just cry out to him, he would come and immediately save the sinner. And this is why we have to keep putting Christ in front of sinners. He is their only hope to come out of the bondage that, that the Bible talks about, that come out of this bondage of this cruel taskmaster. And we need to remind sinners that Jesus Christ is a prince who loves to see his people thrive, loves to see his people grow in blessings under his rule. Have you ever noticed the lies that sinners believe about Jesus? 
I mean, you know, you think about it, most of what I hear sinners say about Jesus doesn't resemble the presentation of Christ in the scriptures at all, right? And unfortunately, what's, what we got now is a problem of biblical illiterates out there, biblical illiterate Christians who don't know how to respond to these lies because they don't know the truth. And here, here's another lie most, most sinners believe. They believe the grave is a safe place for them. They don't realize that, you know what, at the end of the age when Christ comes back and he raises them up, He's going to fit them with a body that will endure eternal conscious punishment forever. The grave is no safe place for the sinner. And I understand, and, and I want to keep dressed and fleshing this out, and why those who sit in darkness, they're under his rule, right? And I know we talked about some of Satan's tricks and his schemes and his tactics in the earlier sermon, but let me give you a, 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 some things to think about how he rules over those in darkness. Number one, he intercepts God's messages to the lost. I want you to think about that for a second. Satan understands that the first step to repentance is for a person to contemplate the message of the gospel, to just sit there and think about it. Well, he doesn't want you to sit there and think about it, does he? Remember when Pharaoh noticed that the children of Israel were turning their thoughts back to God? What, what did he do? He took that as a very dangerous sign, so what did he do? He increased, he increased their physical bondage in an attempt to prevent their spiritual liberty. Satan does the very same thing with his slaves. Satan keeps his slaves too busy to think of heaven or hell. He never leaves them. He's always working to send, you know, intercept thoughts of mercy and grace. Let me give you an example. Let me kind of back this up. With some scripture. Go to Matthew 13. Do you remember the parable of the sower? Look at verse 18 in Jesus' interpretation of that parable. Now, in verse 18, he says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. Notice what one of the, the acts of Satan is, one of his, what he does. He snatches away. Remember, these parables are there to teach us spiritual principles. But notice one of the most devious acts of Satan is just snatching the word away. And parents, we have to be so careful who we allow to influence our children, especially if there's a question about where they are spiritually, right? Because if they're surrounding themselves with negative influences who are constantly trying to, you know, get them to question the veracity of God's word or his promises or, or get him to say, yeah, but, you know, Jesus is an eternal killjoy, right? You've got to be careful of who you let influence your children. Satan is always trying to intercept that message. And I think one of the biggest challenges for, for ministry is this. You know, you bring the word of truth, you bring the gospel, but Satan, he's always there trying to intercept the message. And where are we as Christians? Where are we as parents? Completely oblivious to what our children are doing. So here's the thing. Those that are distracted with worldly affairs, worldly desires, the trinks of this world, you are easy prey for Satan to just come steal and snatch the word away from you. Satan also, number two, interferes with God's messengers. Remember when God sent Moses to deliver Israel, who did Satan send? Remember Janus and Jan Breeze there in uh, Exodus 7-11, they, they were sent to resist him. Remember Moses dealt with all kinds of rebellion in the wilderness from the people of God. So both outside and inside you know, the people of God were there resisting him, trying to rebel against him and his authority. There's always someone there trying to resist the work of, of God's messengers and his ministers. And I'm not just talking about an elder. I'm talking about you as a parent. There's always somebody working behind the scene, it seems like, working against you. And you need to be aware of that. Go to Acts 13. Paul encountered all kinds of... Of resistance and we just need to understand this is what Satan does now I hope you're going back and applying this and what I told you earlier you need to be asking yourself how is Satan doing this in our church how is Satan doing this in my own home you need to be opening your, your understanding because like I said it's easy for us to say yeah I know how he's working over there in that household I know what he's doing in that church over there are we so naive to think he's not busy here are we so naive to think he's not busy in your home working his mischief? Okay. Acts 13, notice this in verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island to uh, Paphos, 
they found a certain sorcerer who a false prophet a jew whose name was bar jesus who was with the proconsul of sergius paulus an intelligent man this man called for barnabas and saul and sought to hear the word of god but notice who comes in to resist but a but Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. There's always someone coming in to do their damage. Paul's preaching the truth, but Satan is trying to resist him by this man. He's a tool of Satan. You see, once again, when we hear that our, our, our weapons, you know, uh, when we hear about our warfare, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. We tend to think that Satan is going to come in with a pitchfork and a pointy tail and some horns on his head. That's not how he works. He's going to work through these people, those he rules, those he oversees. Paul speaks of others in his letters. You turn over to 1 Timothy. He speaks of others who were stumbling blocks. So it's kind of easy to see. Well, well, this man would have been easy to see. I mean, he's a sorcerer after all. But, but let's look at some of these other people. Sometimes it's not so easy to see them and pick them out. But notice here in 1 Timothy 1. Look at verse 17. He says, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone, who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecy previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So Paul's talking about the warfare that's going on. Now notice what he says here. Having faith in the good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have shipwrecked their faith, or suffered shipwreck, <coughs> of whom are Hymenaeus, and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may not learn to blaspheme. You always have these people that are going to come in and be an obstinance or, or resistance to the preaching of the word. Turn over to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, notice verse 14. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words, to no prophets, to ruin the, of the hearers. But be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like a cancer. Hymenius and Philistus are of this sort. And then jump over to chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his work. You must also beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Right? I think you get the point. Whenever the messengers of God are out there doing their business, think about our missionaries, for example. As they're out there, we know there's going to be people there resisting them. We need to pray for them that the Lord would uphold them. They give them eyes to see. Because some of these people that are going to resist him would come in as friends. We need wisdom. We, we need the discernment of God. Turn over to Acts 20. Do you remember this warning that Paul gave these elders here in Ephesus? Acts 20. Satan interferes with the messengers of God. Acts 20. Look at verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He understood that um, Satan was always going to be busy bringing resistance, bringing his people in. He said, OK, well, that's fine. It ought to be pretty easy to see savage wolves coming you know, in the door. But he doesn't stop there. Notice in verse 30, also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So Paul's warning these elders that Satan's going to send people from the outside and from within the church. And what's their goal? Their only goal is to resist. They're going to try to present, you know, prevent the real message of the gospel from going forth. And so as a congregation, we need to be aware of this tendency of Satan. We need to make sure that doesn't happen here. We need to make sure that uh, we can identify when he is busy. And here's the other thing we need to do. This is the problem. This is why I'm emphasizing this issue of hurt feelings. Hurt feelings can turn you into a tool of Satan better, quicker than anything else. You can start being a resistance to the gospel message when you're getting your feelings hurt. You need to resist that. We need to make sure it doesn't happen here. We need to make sure we're not being used as tools of Satan to prevent the messengers of the gospel of God from going forth. Now, that includes your pastor. 
But that includes all teachers of the word of God. But children, you need to understand that you have not been placed in your homes to resist the word of God from going forth within your own home. Your father and mother, for example, may be working through the scriptures with you and your siblings. You should never be a resistance to any of your siblings to receive the gospel. You need to be an encouragement. And there's nothing worse than watching the Lord work on one child, but another sibling who has no interest in the things of God become a resistance to the gospel going forth within that home. Paul says here, verse 30, 31, therefore watch. Therefore watch. We got to keep our guard up. We have to keep our guard up because Satan will come at us where our allegiance to Christ is the weakest, right? So whenever God sends his messengers out, Satan is racing to block. We need to continue to remember our missionaries and our other ministers who are about the business of preaching the word of God. We need to lift them up in prayer. And if you have access, and if you get to, I mean, I, I can remember uh, in other churches we've been to uh, where uh, an individual is dissatisfied. He's not happy with the pastor for some reason. And so they would come to me and bring up all these things that the pastor was doing. And I'd say, well, that does sound horrible. Sounds like we need to get over to his house immediately and bring this to his attention. Oh, well, we don't want to do that because he never listens to us anyway. What is that person at that moment? He's a tool of Satan to resist the gospel from going forward. Now, if that man is guilty of doing the things that they're accusing him of, well, we should go beside him because we love him and come alongside him and encourage him. You see how Satan works in the darkness? So every time that's ever happened, it has been a person whose feelings have gotten hurt. Well, don't be a tool of Satan. Don't be a stumbling block for the ministers of God to go forth and bring the gospel. Once again, I'm not talking about me. Every one of you in here are a minister of the gospel. You're to take it forth, not to be a stumbling block for it to go forth. All right. One of the Puritans reminds children of this sinner be especially wary of carnal friends and relatives when you decide to follow Christ resolve that even if your own child grabs you by the ankles and tries to hold you back from him talking about Christ you will drive them away and then he says to the children and if your father and mother throw themselves in front of you you will not, you will step over their backs if you must to get Christ and he goes on to say let those who will mock and scorn your faith what is heaven worth if you cannot bear a little shame if they spit on your faith on your face Christ will wipe it off they may laugh at you now, but not later. The final outcome has already been declared, and you have sided with the victor. That's it. Satan distracts sinners with delays. This is the next thing I want you to pay attention to. So Satan interferes with God's messengers, but here's one of his other schemes that he works in, and we're not always appreciative of this. Satan distracts sinners with delays. Satan doesn't concern himself with, you know, pleading or reactive thoughts of repentance, right? I suspect there are many uh, who are in hell who at one time gave some thought or considered repenting. But Satan was always able to carry the individuals away on some kind of urgent business. He was always able to distract them and get their mind off the idea of repenting. And, and, and it's that kind of attitude that really, uh, you know, they're underestimating the danger that they're in. I mean... If you ever thought about escaping the wrath that is coming, then you need to flee from your for, for your life, right? You need to flee from Satan. You need to flee to Christ. You need to flee away from lust and deceptions of this world. Satan always says tomorrow. Christ says today. And, and here's the thing. It's that lack of appreciation. It's that lack of understanding of the real danger that the sinner is in that causes so many to misunderstand the teachings of Christ. Turn back over to Luke 9. Let me just give you one to consider. And I think here in the South, it's even worse because, you know, we got this mom and apple pie kind of vision of America, right? And, and these affinities to our family. And we miss out on this, this teaching here because we don't understand what Jesus, what's really behind this teaching of Jesus, right? Look at Luke 9, look at verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, where does that person, have you ever met that person? Right. But this person comes to Jesus and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds in the air and the nest. But the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then a, he said to another, follow me. Now, this is Jesus reaching out and telling another sinner, I want you to follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. 
And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Many look at this text and what's their first response, particularly with that one sinner that he said, follow me. And the guy says, well, let me go bury my daddy. What's your first reaction? Your sentimental reaction is, daddy, I got to bury my daddy. Is Jesus insensitive? Does Jesus not know about daddy? <clears throat> no, Jesus is not insensitive here. Jesus understands that delaying is one of Satan's tactics. When the Lord is in your presence, when the Lord is calling you to repent, you do it and you do it immediately because tomorrow is not promised for you. And so if some of you are still struggling with this, you don't understand the danger that hangs over the head of the sinner. If your sympathies goes with this man who refuses to stop and follow Christ at that moment and not with Christ, you don't understand the dangers that hangs over the head of the sinner. Let me get you to think about it this way. When the wrath of God came pouring down out of heaven like fire on top of Sodom and Gomorrah, do you think... You know, do you think Lot was worried about? I wonder who I need to go bury. See, we need to be thinking about the wrath of God in such terms. Why was he not worried about burying any dead folks in that forsaken city? Right? He was fleeing for his life. But you know what? There was one in his group that was thinking about it. His wife. As she looks back. Thought about why she was looking back. It's up to her. They would have not heeded the warning. They would have stayed there. I've got friends here. I've got people I care about in this in this forsaken city. There was something about that place that caused her to look back. Think about the days of Noah. Noah preached all those years about the coming judgment of God. None of them heeded the warning. Now contrast that with Abraham. God says, you know what? Get out of this comfortable city of Ur. I'm going to take you to a far land that you know nothing about. You're just going to follow me. And you're going to trust me. And what does Abraham do? He immediately obeys. And the blessings that follow through that obedience are captured here in the scriptures. The point here is do not allow Satan to gain a foothold by causing you to delay the pleas of Christ. One of Satan's greatest tricks, and it works generation after generation for the lost, and they stay in that lost condition, is they delay to heed the warnings of Christ. And he's okay with you thinking about it and hearing and, and, and giving a, just a moment's thought about it, but he's going to quickly bring in something to distract you. The Lord calls you to flee the wrath of God to come. You stop what you do, you're doing. You don't let this day pass by and you repent. Next, Satan tempts us to compromise. Now, if you don't fall for the other categories of Satan's ploys, then Satan, Satan's okay. He didn't have to get you to do these other ones, but this one here, he's okay. He's content with you compromising. Satan will always propose a compromise. And so you need to understand this. You're going to submit to the temptation to compromise if Christ is not the king of your heart. Do you remember one of the times that Pharaoh agreed to let the children of Israel go out into the wilderness? Remember what he said? You may go, but don't go too far. Exodus 8, 28, right? You see, Satan is okay with you reading the word and praying as long as you don't go too far from your sin. He's all right with that. He's okay with you coming to church. He's okay with you reading the word of God. But if you keep yourself immersed in an in a atmosphere of sin, a, a climate that promotes sin and not the submission to, the, to Christ, he's okay with that. Let me explain why some of you go back into your sin time and time again. You see, Christ has to be king of all of your heart or he's not king at all. The sinner must break with sin and destroy all bridges that would allow you to turn back to sin. And here's the problem. Many who profess to be Christians will simply not cut the bridges off that, you know, tempt them to sin. They compromise. All right? Think about the person who struggles with porn, but they refuse to take drastic measures that, require, that, that would be required to break the power of sin in their life. Look, if you're serious about sin, then cut off all avenues that tempt you to return to that sin. You, you, you may have to cut off certain relationships. Many Christians are not willing to do this. I mean, for me, 
I tried that game of keeping my friends because, after all, they needed to hear the gospel. But if they were going to tempt me to do things that would be dishonoring to my king, and I couldn't condone myself as a Christian, I needed to cut off certain relationships. And that's the conclusion I came to. Certain friends, although I love them, they're just not an influence in my life anymore. And they haven't been for over 20-something years. Many Christians aren't willing to do that. Many of those who profess to be Christians are not willing to make a break with sin and cut off things that would lead them to sin. Never forget, anyone who tempts you to compromise, they're coming under the banner of, Christ, of Satan. They're not under the banner of Christ. Why? Christ never calls his soldiers to compromise, ever. Christ calls his soldiers to claim victory on the battlefield. We are to walk in the footsteps of Christ. Let me get you to think about this for just a moment. You come into John chapter 2. He starts his, his earthly ministry. You know, or, well, when he goes into Jerusalem there in, in John 2 at the time of Passover, what does he do? He takes a whip and drives the Pharisees out. Okay. He clears the temple. Also in Luke 4, after he comes out of the wilderness from being tempted by Satan, where does he go according to Luke 4? He goes to Nazareth to his local synagogue. And remember, these are people he would have grown up around. You know, that boy Jesus, he is so respectful to his parents. I mean, I'm sure he had a good attitude. I'm sure he had a good reputation, right? That's what Luke says earlier, you know. He gained a favor with God and man. So, I mean, he, he had a, probably a winsome personality. He probably stood out amongst the teenagers, right? But he goes into the synagogue. He preaches his first sermon. And what do they do at the time when he finishes preaching his sermon? Do you remember Luke 4? They take him out to a mountain to throw him off the side. What kind of sermon was that? I mean, what kind of sermon do you think he preached that caused people to, to, to want to kill him? But during his earthly ministry, he constantly goes after those who put their hope in Judaism. He constantly went after the Pharisees who were described as the blind leading the blind. They were destroying the souls of others. Remember, turn over to Matthew 15. He starts his ministry that way, and he continues it in Matthew 15, 12. Um, then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And what did Jesus say? You know, maybe I ought to consider my tone. Maybe I ought to rethink my delivery. You know, I don't really want to offend these people. It's not what he says at all. He keeps going after them, doesn't he? In fact, he actually provokes the conflict. Now, here's another sin that God would have or, or Satan would have you to believe. In life. Some say, yeah, I know all their theology is wrong, and I really understand that most of their life doesn't align with submitting to Christ and, and what he desires. But you know what? They're so sincere. That's another life Satan isn't. That's another compromise that we make within our mind to justify simple behavior of our family members or friends that we refuse to go and confront with the truth of the gospel. But you know what? Here's the thing with sincerity. I'm sure there's a bunch of sincere Muslims out there. Right? You know, they're so sincere they fly planes in the side of buildings. They're so sincere they strap bombs to themselves and walk into marketplaces and detonate them. They're very sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. Paul talks about how sincere he was as Saul, a Pharisee. But he did not possess the righteousness of Christ. He had a zeal as a Pharisee beyond anybody else. But he was sincerely wrong. My point bringing all this up is that when Christ goes after those who are wrong, he never sat down and said, look, we're really looking bad in front of the people. We're always arguing. You're trying to kill me. I'm always showing you up and making you look bad in front of the people. Let's just find some common ground. We both like Abraham and Moses. He never does this. He never does this. He goes for the jugular. Matthew 23. He calls them out for everything that they are. He never compromised. He never changed the tone of his message. He never changed the tone of his message because it upset them. And so the point here is we're to never compromise with sinners so they can feel good about their sin and in the darkness they stay in. He never sat down and said, let's just find that common ground we can agree upon. Compromise is the language of Satan. I want to make sure we're clear on this. If you like a blue house and I like a brown one, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about personal preferences, right? There is a time when compromise works on things that are not eternal. 
right? We're talking about the word of God. We're talking about his truth. And we're talking about obedience to his word. That's not the time for compromise. It's a time for understanding what God's word says and how do we apply it. So we need to avoid the language of compromise when it comes to the truth of God's word and obedience to that word. Now let me just say this. We keep talking about, I've been using some of this, this language of the, you know, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, right? We keep referring back to them. But remember, the children of Israel, here's another thing when we compromise. The children of Israel called out for deliverance, right? They have hard ta taskmasters. They're under this, these taskmasters. God delivers them. The same is true for us. So here's the thing. If you're here this morning, you're struggling on the battlefield, and, and you even give a thought to compromising with the enemy, to just, you know, and compromising with the enemy is just to relieve some of the pressure you're under. Then you need to cry out to Christ like they did in that day. Don't doubt his delivering power. He is the king over all. He has chosen you as his bride. Uh, your maker, your king is your groom. Now, here's the thing. Before you can become his bride, you got to be willing to leave Egypt. Right? You got to be willing to leave Egypt. So, the question for all of us this morning, have you left? Have you kissed the things of this world goodbye and said, they're not of any interest to me. My groom has called me out. Are you the kind of person, though? You started to leave Egypt. And, and remember, there were many who left Egypt, followed Moses out. But what happened? The moment they crossed over and the journey got hard, the journey got difficult, what did they want to do? wanted to go back. Are you one of those persons today? Many of you kids have made a profession of faith. Maybe you didn't count the cost. You started going out and you realized, you know what? Christ expects a lot out of me. And you're contemplating. You're in a dangerous place right now because you're contemplating. This is, this is harder than I thought. Well, it's hard because you're not walking in grace, right? But you're thinking about going back. You want to go back to Egypt. It'd be a foolish decision. Are you such a person? It'd be sad for you to go back to the world. It'd be sad for you to go back to Egypt. Because what you're doing is you're turning from the inheritance that God promises to give you. Just so you can go back to bondage. God has preserved the story of redemption of the children of Israel to remind us of the foolishness of turning back from the blessings of God to go back to the curses of Pharaoh. And here's the thing. We need parents. We need to remember this children. Some of you get kind of close. Some of you gonna get married here in the next several years. Children, you need to understand this. Don't underestimate Satan's schemes. Here's why. Because they have worked generation after generation. He really hasn't changed his strategy, has he? And it keeps working. Well, let me stop here. I got a lot more I want to say about this. But let me just stop here because I want to pick up on this next week. <clears throat> we have covered this morning. That what we have covered this morning is very important for us as a body to, to grasp as a church. If the Lord desires to keep us as a church, to keep this church around, then we need to understand we will be attacked. Right? It's given. It's going to happen. Satan has no desire for churches that call sinners to true repentance. You know, Satan has no desire for true churches that exhort sinners from, you know, um, serving self, you know, serving sin, serving Satan. He doesn't have a desire for a church to stand that calls people to submit to the kingship of Christ. So we need to be wise. We need to be wise of his schemes. We need to be aware that he will come after the people of God uh, to steal the message of the gospel away from us. He's going to send people. Uh, to encourage us to compromise. And, and I hope you understand, when we hear the language of compromise, think Satan. Christ doesn't compromise with anybody. Satan will come in and send us worldly distractions to take our focus off, off of him. Off of you know, Satan does not want us to adore. He doesn't want us to have any of our affections towards Christ. There is one thing. Let me just let me talk about this for just a second. There is one more deception of Satan I think we need to be aware of. Satan can cause sinners who are playing in sin to look to good works to save them. I think that's one of his greatest deceptions. I mean, isn't that what he did with the Pharisees? I mean, you've met people who live in sin. They have no desire for Christ and his kingdom. But they come, and, and, and this is really a problem that plagues the South, right? They do a few good works, how they define good, right? And they raise them, well... My good will outweigh my bad, and I'll just 
I'll, I may make it into heaven by the skin of my teeth, but I'll make it, right? So they deceive themselves. That That is a deception of Satan. Never forget this. Good works cannot save us. The Christian understands only Christ can save. That's where we put our hope. Now, certainly one of the things that Christ does is he produces good works within us. But that work is a fruit. It's not the ground. It's not the basis of our salvation. So let us not fall for Satan's trick here. If you like playing in your sin, but then I'm going to do some good things, that ain't going to save you. It's just not. Don't under underestimate that deception because Satan deceived the first. You know, when Christ walks into Israel in the first century, this is full of religious leaders who did good. They prayed, they fasted, they did charitable deeds, and every one of those, quote, good works were wicked based on Christ's definition of what's wicked. These Jews looked to their works rather than to their Messiah for salvation. Satan had them right with I mean, Satan didn't care that these Pharisees were reading the, the Old Testament, did he? Because they were using that as a basis of salvation for themselves. Satan had them right where they want them. So don't underestimate how Satan can use good works to feed your arrogance, to feed your pride. And it is that pride and that arrogance that caused these men who, quote, did good works to kill the Messiah. Satan will bring that deception in that lie. And finally, as parents, so let's go back. As a church, we need to understand and expect Satan's going to come in. He's going to attack. He's going to work his mischief. He's not going to come in here waving a banner. Every now and then you'll have some, you know, uh, Yahoo that, that disturbs the, the peace and the unity that we have here. That Those are easy to deal with, right? Satan's most destructive battle or weapon that he uses against us in this battle is to come under these different cloaks. We need to be careful of that. As parents, we need to also meditate on what we have learned because Satan is not only active here in our church, but he's active in your home. You know that. If you don't know that, now you know it, right? You know he's active in your home, right? And if you are here this morning thinking he's not, then he's got you right where you want. He wants you. Ignorant, naive, that he's not actually working. Okay? You're in battle. Fathers and mothers, do you think he is not active within your home? So you have to ask yourself, and this is where you have to get together. <clears throat> as husband and wife, and as your children get more mature in the faith, you might start bringing them into to the, to the question, where is he wreaking havoc within our home? Where have we let our guard down? Because we should expect his activity. What is he doing to draw your children away from Christ? Where is he busily doing this? Where is he working? Where is he trying to get you or your children to compromise the faith? I mean, I went through this whole list of things of how he keeps people in darkness and in bondage. You don't think he's, he's working? You don't think he's active? Where is he trying to get your child not to think rightly about sin? Is worldliness creeping in? Right? Do, do they have a greater affection for the trinkets of this world? And here's the thing. Are we as parents feeding these appetites in their lives? Are we feeding them to want the things of this earth rather than storing up treasures in heaven? I think there's a lot we need to be really self-reflecting on in this area. Because I think one of the best things he can do is lull us to sleep and say, you know what? At least our children are not out there slinging drugs around or doing whatever it is worldly kids do. Right these days. I don't even know what the latest fads are. But the point here is this. Don't think he can't come into your home because the children of Israel, in their arrogance and pride, thought he ain't busy in our country. And Jesus exposed everything that Satan was doing in that land. And what did it do? It did not provoke a sense of repentance and humility. It only aggravated their pride and arrogance, and they took him to the cross. Don't think Satan can't work on you. Don't think Satan can't deceive you. So what's the remedy to this darkness? It is the light. It is submitting to this light. If the light is hurting you and it, and, and it just, you know, it just has, you don't have any attraction towards the light of God's word, you need to be crying out for mercy. You need to be crying out for mercy. We need to spend time as a group of believers asking ourselves, take these teachings of spiritual warfare seriously and asking, 
where is he wreaking havoc? Unless you think God's word is lying and, and, and you're, re you're not wrestling. You see, some of us are, are under this idea, of, well, we just had a bad day today. Satan is not a bad day. He is the destroyer of souls. He is the destroyer of homes. He is the destroyer of communities. He's the destroyer of nations. Understand that. Never underestimate it. But we serve a mighty God who would just one look, one blink, cast him away, right? That's where we need to go and find refuge. We need to take, remember, we're spending time building this foundation of the nature of our warfare because if I don't spend this time, when I start talking about the armor, you're going to say, yeah, that was some neat stuff about the helmet of salvation, and you'll never put it on. I'm hoping I'm laying the foundation for you to see the reason why you need to put it on, why you need the shield of faith, why you need to know how to wield the sword of the Spirit. And I hope we as parents are not raising a bunch of biblical illiterates that do not know how to handle the sword of the Spirit. If we don't know how to speak, season our words with grace and speak the word of God in due season. That comes from studying, but it comes from applying, right? You can study how to handle a sword, but at some point you got to use it. And that's where you, you know, you hone in your skills. That's wisdom, applying the word of God, applying the sword of the spirit. A lot of work to be done, right? And so we need to go to the Lord. First thing I think we need to do is spend time as family sitting around asking ourselves, where is he reaching? Where is he wreaking havoc within our homes? Where is he coming after us? Where is our allegiance to Christ the weakest? That's where he's going to be. That's where he's going to be busy, right? So let's go before the Lord and ask for the grace and mercy that he would pour out on us to give us eyes to see where our enemy is coming after us. Father, once again, thank you so much for the clarity of your word. We thank you for warning us of this enemy who would desire to see us be brought down. So we ask for wisdom and clarity. We ask that you would use us to stand strong. We pray that uh, this would give us a sense of urgency. Uh, for why we should put on all the spiritual armament and that you would, if we have been lulled to sleep, uh, Father, we pray that you would wake us up, that you would help us to be watchful and always pray, that we would always be sticking close to the captain of our salvation and following his footsteps. And so, Father, may this give us a greater uh, sense of need and urgency to cling to him and him alone. And so, Father, I pray that you would waken us up May you help us see where Satan is doing his worst damage in our church, within our within our own homes. And Father, uh, may you use us to help others to come out from under the bondage of darkness. Not because we have all the answers, but we have the spirit of the true God who does within us. So Father, we pray that you would help us to be uh, loving towards those who are sitting in darkness by bringing the truth of your word into their lives. And so Father, we pray uh, for your work within our lives, your work to expose, your work to uh, help us draw closer to Christ and see him in all of his beauty and his glory. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.